my clock. So I think we can go ahead and get started and people will keep rolling in, I'm sure, coming from their previous Zoom or from clinic, wherever you guys are coming. Uh, we just appreciate that you're here and want to welcome you all uh, to the Women's Wellbeing Lecture Series and uh, funded by the Rosemary Bowes PhD Women's Mental Health Fund. And a big thank you to Dr. Bowes for um, both being the impetus for this in, in terms of having the idea of this particular lecture, but also uh, allowing us to have the funds to be able to do it. And I hope she is here to be able to hear this. If not, we will definitely send her a recording. So who am I? I am Lee Frame. I'm the Associate Director of the GW Resiliency and Wellbeing Center, which houses the Women's Wellbeing Lecture Series. And then as a quick reminder, for those of you who don't know, or if you forget, the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center is here to serve you. Uh, we offer personalized services to individuals as well as units and departments. Uh, and the idea is we want to support you having a sense of purpose and wellness or well-being. Uh, to arrange a consultation with us, you can complete the consultation request form on our website. Now, how do you get there? You can find it under the About drop-down menu on the SMHS homepage. So if you're at the SMHS website, go to About, and we are right there. Or you can navigate directly to us at rwc smhs.gwu.edu, which we will put in the chat shortly to be a little bit more convenient. Today, Lucy A. Huttner, MD, joined us to give a talk on skills to support women's well-being. Dr. Huttner is an internationally recognized expert in women's mental health. She's one of a small group of psychiatrists in New York City with extensive expertise in reproductive psychiatry, which focuses on the mental health needs of women and their loved ones before, during, and after pregnancy. She's had particular expertise in perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and in the, psychi in the psychiatric issues of high-risk pregnancies and infertility. Dr. Huttner is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Wesleyan University, and she received her MD in 2003 from the University of California, San Francisco. She completed residency training at Harvard, where she was one of the chief residents. She then completed her fellowship at Columbia University. Dr. Huttner served as the Associate Director of the Women's Program at Columbia, where she created and directed the first dedicated consult service for inpatient obstetrics and was a psychiatric liaison to the high-risk maternal fetal medicine practice. Dr. Huttner was also a consulting psychiatrist to the Columbia Intensive Outpatient Treatment Program, which focuses on young adults with mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and eating disorders. Dr. Huttner received the American Psychiatric Association Leadership Fellowship, the Mass General Hospital Thomas Hackett Award, and the Lachlan Fellowship. Dr. Huntner served on the American Psychiatric Association Scientific Program Committee from 2010 to 2015. In 2016, she was inducted into the highly selective American College of Psychiatrists, which has a total membership of fewer than 1,000 psychiatrists nationwide. And then in 2020 and 2021, she was named a top doc. So she's certainly a very impressive person. She's also a dear friend of our women's well-being champion, Lisa Catapano. So there's another big bonus for her. And we are really thankful to have her here with us today. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Lucy. Thank you. Oh, thank you so very much for that really kind introduction. And it's so wonderful to see everybody here. Can everybody hear me okay and see me okay? Okay, terrific. Um, it's a really lovely day here in New York and it's just so nice to see you all. I'm delighted to be here for to give this lecture. And just a couple of disclosures before I get started. Um, I do, um, I am the co-founder and advisor of um, one um, uh, pregnancy related startup, which is called Phoebe. I'm also a consultant and strategic advisor to a second startup, which is called Gemma. And um, I was the lead editor for the American Psychiatric Association's textbook of women's reproductive mental health that Lisa was also an editor for. And I do collect royalties for that. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit today about one of my absolute favorite topics, which is, and I heard it was sort of a favorite topic of this lecture series too, so I'm so excited about it. It's really, um, you know, all of us, I think, you know, if we just pull back a second, and I'm not sure I can see everybody in this audience, but if we could all raise our hands or click something, if you have either known or cared for a woman who may have mood symptoms either before, during, or after pregnancy or anywhere else along the reproductive lifespan, right? Would we all say that's a fairly common scenario, right? 
And, you know, luckily there's been much more in our academic understanding in the last decade, as well as sort of more of a public understanding in the last decade or so about the importance of understanding mood disorders as they affect women throughout the reproductive lifespan, particularly in preconception pregnancy and postpartum. But something that is less recognized, I'm not gonna go into some of the details around um, caring for mood disorders in this period of time. What I'm gonna focus on a little bit more is a little bit of the, the approach. How do we actually talk to women and pregnant people throughout this period of time? What are some of the, the pieces that we would start to think about in our clinical interaction? And most importantly, what do we think about so that the person ends up feeling like they've gone through the, the interaction, feeling validated, empowered, and most importantly, that they don't feel judged. Um, and this is a really subtle point, but I think it's a little bit so I'm going to be talking today a little bit less about the content of what we think about in women's mental health and think a little bit more of the process of the conversation itself. So this is like a, this is a case example I just thought I would start with. Um, RS is a 34-year-old woman. She is G1P1. She is newly postpartum for six weeks. And she presents to her psychiatrist um, and she's reporting depressed mood. She has some ruminations with intermittent intrusive thoughts about any concerns about health of her baby. And of course, uh, difficulty with sleep. And she doesn't have appear to have acute safety concerns with either suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation, or psychotic symptoms. Who has ever cared for a patient who sounds almost exactly like this? Right, very, very classic scenario. And one of the reasons why is because we know that postpartum depression um, is um, the, um, it tends to come on in the first four to six weeks postpartum. And if we read a little bit about what she says, so again, if we put on our process hat and we listen carefully to what she says, she says, you know, it's been a lot, and I'm gonna paraphrase here, it's been much, much harder than I thought it would be, uh, a lot harder than I ever thought it would be. Getting caught up in how hard it was to breastfeed, which was also a lot harder than I thought it would be, not getting any sleep, trying to heal from the C-section. And then, of course, I have to start thinking about going back to work and I don't feel ready, not at all. I feel like I must need more support and be able to take a break every once in a while, but. Now my family has gone back to the West Coast, they were visiting, and I feel really guilty about the idea of hiring any extra help. I just don't wanna spend the money. It's also been really hard with the pandemic because I get very worried about who's coming in and out of my house, just the, the navigating who has been tested, who has not been tested. And honestly, it, feel, it makes me feel really guilty because I feel like I should be able to handle this all on my own. And, um, I, I'll, I will hope to open up this to discussion and questions at the end, um, but what we can see right away are some of the elements of how this person could come to this discussion already with the idea of, am I going to be judged by the psychiatrist or the doctor who is gonna be caring for this person saying, I feel like I, should be able to do this on my own. I feel like I shouldn't need the support even though I do. I feel like I should be handling, recovering, going back to work, trying to breastfeed, sleep deprivation, and I should be okay with it all and I'm not. And it's been a lot harder than I thought. And then she goes on to say, but it makes me feel really terrible about myself because I feel like I'm already not being a good parent. I look at social media, how is that familiar with everybody here, right? I look at social media at everybody's photos and everybody makes it look so easy. I feel so overwhelmed most of the time, but that also makes me feel terrible about myself because I feel like I should be doing a better job of it all. And then on the other hand, she says, and even though, and I'm paraphrasing here, even though I'm worried about whether I'm depressed, I'm equally worried about taking a medication. I'm worried that I'm gonna harm my baby in some way by the medication going through the breast milk. 
I feel like I should just deal with the symptoms on my own. I would rather suffer than do anything that might possibly harm my baby. So this is um, a really classic scenario that we as reproductive psychiatrists, I see Dr. Katapano here, we as reproductive psychiatrists um, see very, very commonly. And you can see that the process of this conversation, the process of this discussion is already leading itself to a bit of a bind. You can hear the bind that she's in, right? Feeling like she should be handling this all on her own. She should be a perfect mother. She should, she already feels terrible about herself. So she's having a lot of guilt and self-blame. And then she's worried though, this sort of bind that we deal with all the time with our patients, which is, I'm worried I might be depressed, but on the other hand, I'm really worried about doing anything about it because I'm afraid of the consequences of taking a medication. This, these are classic situations that we see in the postpartum period. And again, what I really wanna emphasize is we can already see that her guilt and self-blame is opening up the door to feeling judging of herself and we want to then really make sure that she doesn't absorb any perceived judgment um, from our end as well. So this is a sort of very careful type of conversation that I would start to have with this patient. And just to give you a little bit of background, even though we're not going to really be focusing again on any specifics of women's mental health or postpartum, but just to get us all on the same page, you know, this is a very common scenario. Postpartum depression is widely considered the most common complication of childbirth overall for women and other pregnant people. It has a typical prevalence of about 10 to 15%. However, that was prior to the pandemic. And um, I don't know, you probably all read the Washington Post. There was a, an article in the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago, citing a study that said that actually in the pandemic, the rates of reported positivity of depressive symptoms in postpartum patients was actually over 30%. So it has gone sky high during the pandemic. And we can talk, so if someone has questions about that, I, I can talk a little bit about that um, afterwards. Um, mood and anxiety disorders tend to correlate strongly with times of reproductive transitions. For example, we know that the postpartum period already is a time of drastic biologic, so psychologic, and social change, and those changes open the door to psychiatric vulnerability. And then, of course, because there are really significant existing healthcare disparities, those are exacerbated during this vulnerable time, and they serve as a barrier to quality and timely care, particularly for minoritized women and their families, um, uh, Black and brown communities in particular. And I won't go into the details of this again, but we all, um, I am happy to provide references about this as well, um, but the mood and anxiety disorders in the perinatal period have a very significant impact on both obstetric, psychiatric, parent, infant, and child outcomes. So if we go back to the case of RS, we think to ourselves, okay, she's presenting with perhaps anxiety symptoms that we wanna evaluate. We wanna make sure to rule her out for depression. She is clearly reporting significant stressors. But then we think, what does this person need during this interaction? And with me as a psychiatrist or any other doctor that she might see, part of what we can hear right away is some of the stigma coming through loud and clear. I feel like I might be depressed, but I don't wanna take medications. I might be depressed, but I'm afraid to tell other people. I might be really feeling alone and isolated, but I feel like I should be able to do it on my own. So feeling like she's the only person in the world who is feeling this way and feeling like she needs to sort of not uh, emphasize how much her distress is really there. We can all hear that guilt and self-blame, boy, did that come up right, right away in the first couple of sentences of this interaction. Also a sense of perfectionism, right? Feeling like you have to be the perfect mother at all times. And that often takes the, the, the form of, I have to be meeting my baby's needs at all times 
perfectly, no matter how exhausted I am, no matter how depressed I am, no matter how little maternity leave I have, no matter what, I also have to do a perfect job in caring for my baby, which sets up a really impossible bind. And it sets up a feeling of judgment, both of self-judgment and judgment and feeling the judgment of others. There's also really this difficulty with lack of accurate information because, you know, any of us who, any person, any patient who immediately Googles medications and breastfeeding, you could encounter accurate information, but you, more than likely you're going to enter a sort of morass of people's opinions, a lot of people's agendas, some highly inaccurate information, um, including the idea that somehow there's not data to support um, evidence-based discussions in women's mental health, which is not true at all. And so this person is likely going to be swimming in a sea of unreliable information and not exactly sure where to turn. And then also the last thing I would say is that this person comes to this interaction potentially concerned about reporting their symptoms. Um, it is not uncommon that women, particularly in the postpartum period, are worried. They say, if I am really depressed, if I report feeling even suicidal or severe anxiety, if I report anything psychiatric at all, is ACS, some sort of child protective services going to be called and will I lose my baby? And so what I'm gonna do next is go through a four step process of how we might approach this conversation. And again, I'm gonna be including some of the content of what we're talking about, but I really wanna pay attention to how we would think about this conversation with this patient who comes to us. So the very first thing that we wanna do is um, uh, something that I, I think is very natural, but something that I try not to do if possible, is it's very natural as a response, as the person sort of trying to care for this person to sort of say, don't worry, it's all gonna get better. We wanna reassure them. We wanna jump into fixing mode. You wanna jump into rescue mode. And the difficulty is that this person already feels very overwhelmed and they already feel like they're in a bind. And so, and they've probably already had well-meaning friends and family who say, you'll get through it. It's just the first period of time, right? And strangely enough, those well-meaning messages, even though they're factually accurate, they can end up feeling ever so slightly invalidating because it doesn't really touch upon the depth of the distress. And so one of the very first things I do really honestly as a psychotherapist and as a women's mental health specialist, really what I do almost every single time as step one is I try to validate the truth of their experience. This is something that I go back to over and over and over again, which is the idea of how do I actually validate the truth not just of my own factual information that I have in my own mind, but validate the truth of her experience. So the first thing that happens is that she feels heard. And so one way to validate someone who is going through something like this is to think to yourself, okay, I'm going to recognize the enormity of what she's going through because I know in my own experience and having studied this area, you can say to yourself, this is a time of adapting to massive changes, hormonal changes, physiologic changes, of recovering from delivery. There are a lot of changes in family roles and responsibilities. She's enduring sleep deprivation and she's caring and feeding a newborn. This is an enormous set of changes. And she reflected that as soon as she walked in, right? She was basically saying, I'm overwhelmed. And so what you can do as step one is you can normalize their experience and validate their truth. So something that you might say, and again, I'm just going to paraphrase, is you could say something like, you know, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And there's a good reason why postpartum anxiety and mood issues are so common after childbirth. 
One of the reasons why I would say something like that right away is that we want to give them a message, you're not alone. We want to give them a destigmatizing message of a lot of people feel this way, it's not just you. We also want to give them a message of this is common, which means that there are people out here who can really help you, you're not alone. And to put her symptoms in a normalized context by saying, think about everything you just mentioned, the sleeping, the physical recovery, work, we can realize that you're basically going through an enormous amount of changes all at once. And every time someone goes through a change, that represents a stressor. And you're going through those all at the same time and you're not alone. You know, and one of the, you know, there is a whole literature out there. It's actually kind of complicated in many ways to tease apart stress from anxiety, from depression in women's mental health most of the time they're actually interrelated. So for example, um, postpartum anxiety is comorbid with postpartum depression over 80% of the time. And stress, ongoing different stressors are often strongly intermingled with anxiety and depression. Now, and one of the ways that I like to approach this is because, again, the idea of, um, I can't tell you how many patients I have had who have said something like, I'm sure I'm going to get postpartum depression. I'm sure I'm going to be just like Adele. I'm sure I'm going to be just like Gwyneth Paltrow. I'm sure I'm going to be one of those people who really suffered with postpartum depression. I'm sure I'm going to be really sort of overwhelmed by postpartum anxiety. But one nice sort of entry point into validating their experience and normalizing it is to start with the entry point of stress and just simply naming their experience. Like, hey, even though this is a positive development in your life, it's a major role shift. And anybody who is experiencing changes in their life, anybody experiences those changes as a stress. You happen to have four or five changes going on all at once. And that then understandably leads to even more stress, which then we understand is linked with anxiety and depression. Um, that way, again, you're sort of contextualizing everything that's going on for them. And also the other thing I do when I try and validate this, and this gets to um, the idea of placing this in context, what we wanna do is also pull this away from the person as an individual, because you could hear some of the guilt and self-blame already happening. I should be able to handle this. This is all my fault. I should be perfect. And what we wanna do is say like, hey, let's place you in a context here. You're dealing with multiple different stressors at once and any normal person is going to feel the stress of that. Um, the other thing that I like to do is immediately uh, talk about the idea of perfectionism because this is something that goes on all the time and I cannot tell you how many times I've heard the idea of, they don't, patients don't typically say something like, I need to be the perfect parent. You know, I think most people understand that that's somewhat unrealistic, but the idea of the best parent and the, per the type of parent that I want to be is the person that gives all the time, no matter what. And part of what I try to introduce right away is alternatives to that idea, because it's impossible for us to give all the time. That is simply an impossible idea. We have to sleep. We have to care for ourselves. We have to rest. We have to do other things. And so I try to introduce alternative scenarios or alternative ideas as quickly as possible. So for example, Winnicott, who was a British pediatrician and child psychiatrist, we may all be familiar with the idea of a good enough parent. Now, uh, as opposed to a perfect parent, a good enough parent is, a, is the idea of mostly consistently as best as you can, meeting the needs of the, the baby, understanding that no one person can meet those needs all the time. Um, and I might not really focus on that too terribly much, especially with someone who is really distressed, but I do start to try and um, introduce the fact that, hey, what we consider the best type of parent or the best type of parent is a good enough parent. This is what the experts recommend. 
And then the second major thing that can be very useful when done, let's say slowly, and I try not to overwhelm them with information, is really to educate. And you would think like, why does educating really make a difference in terms of whether someone experiences judgment or not? But I would actually go so far as to say that education is almost the most important thing. I'm going to um, uh, uh, move away from this case for uh, to talk about someone who actually just called me the other day. And she just found out that she was newly pregnant. She's a 36 year old woman who is stable on Lexapro as well as medications that she uses for sleep, Clonopin and Ambien. And she was reporting feeling very, very anxious because she had been told that under no circumstances can she take either of those medications, Clonopin or Ambien at all during any part of her pregnancy. Um, she had been told that by her ob who also, and there was also her primary care said something similar. She called me in a panic because she had in fact been taking these medications while pregnant and now was terrified that she had done something wrong. And in fact, that's actually not factually accurate information. And when in the consultation phone call, again, I had just been speaking with her for about 15, 20 minutes, just the idea that it doesn't need to be a black and white situation, that actually having a proper understanding of the way these medications work and the fact that this is evidence-based, this is not just one person's opinion versus another, that there is robust evidence to talk about this. What I heard her say at the end was, I cannot tell you how relieved I know there is to know that there are solutions. And hear that little moment of self-efficacy, that's what we're reaching for. That's what we're reaching for is the moment that someone understands that they have the belief that they can not be controlled by their symptoms and feel like they're in an unending panic attack, but also feel like there are solutions. Because the other thing I'll say about stress and anxiety, particularly when it comes to women's mental health and pregnancy, again, there's often this bind. And this is why how we talk to our patients is so important. There's this bind because people feel like, well, I can't take anything for the stress because I was just told I can never take Clonopin under any circumstances and I can never have Ambien past my lips and none of this can ever occur. But I'm also really worried because I read on the internet that stress is terrible for my pregnancy and now I'm gonna have terrible outcomes. And now I'm gonna feel very guilty about that because I shouldn't be anxious, right? So people get really caught up in a bind and um, part of our job is to provide them with enough evidence-based data so that, that then you can start to have a moment of self-efficacy and, and they can say, oh, wait a minute, this is not black and white. I can learn about this. I can have understanding of the data and that can help me make decisions. So what we wanna do is we want to, I typically with someone who's this overwhelmed, I would typically say something like, hey, let's talk a little bit about the facts um, and see if we can get some data here. And let's talk about the most important issue for you first. So let's prioritize. If you, we just mentioned four or five major areas, I'll often ask the question, if there's something that could change for you, if we could wave a magic wand and have one thing change, what would it be? Now, someone in the early postpartum period is most likely going to say, I need more sleep or I need more support with feeding my infant. Those are the two definitely the most um, uh, uh, salient issues that come up in that period of time. But it's more important, again, to just allow the person to name their highest priority option. Because again, if I flood them with education, and if I say, get more sleep, allow your partner to feed, don't worry about breastfeeding quite as much, you have maternity leave in your state, da, 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 right? They are, they are likely going to feel overwhelmed, flooded, and not remember most of what I'm talking about anyway. And then they're going to go away still with the guilt and self-blame and feeling alone. So when I do educate, I try to really focus on one fact at a time. 
And I typically try and focus on the facts that are most important to them, their highest yield issues. Um, uh, when we were doing background research for um, the project I was working on with a postpartum digital roadmap, um, one of the things that we did was just interview a hundred people and said, if you could have made your postpartum experience improved at all, what would you have done? Number one was sleep and number two was breastfeeding. And those things um, are true in the evidence as well. So we can sort of hypothesize about what someone is going to say, but the most important thing is to, to, to listen to their truth. Um, sometimes people will surprise you, right? Sometimes people will say, hey, I understand about sleep. I understand about breastfeeding. What I'm really stressed about is I'm going back to work in two weeks and I am not ready and I don't feel comfortable with that. So again, we want to go to where the patient is and really meet them where they are. And that might involve supporting choices around infant feeding, recognizing that we need to balance infant feeding with a mother's well-being. So that's specific to this case again, but that's a very nuanced topic. Um, recognizing the need for sleep and its impact on mental health, and then emphasize the benefits of improving your own maternal mental health. So this is something that I talk about a lot, which can also reduce the sense of judgment and stigma, which is, hey, you know what? You're actually doing the very best thing that you can for your family by taking care of your well-being because taking care of your well-being will translate into X, Y, and Z outcomes. And this is what's gonna be beneficial for your child and your family overall. And so what I might say to them is let's go step-by-step. Step. Let's figure out one thing at a time. You mentioned the idea that you didn't wanna take a medication. If I was talking about medication with her because you don't wanna have any potential um, harm to the baby. And again, destigmatizing again, so many of our patients mentioned this concern as well. And this is actually one of the reasons why we study this so carefully. So maybe we should take some time and clarify um, our thoughts about medication use in pregnancy. Uh, and in breastfeeding. And it's interesting because um, the reason why I put this vignette right here and talking about medication is I cannot tell you how much misinformation is out there. So for example, we all understand that the FDA got rid of its categorization system of medications in pregnancy and breastfeeding. They used to have a categorization system of A, B, C, D, and X. That was actually eradicated in 2015 because the FDA recognized that there were a lot of fallacies with that system. However, I can tell you right now that like, the minute anyone Googles it, many doctors, many people who just search things on their own, they still think that this categorization system is intact. And so they will say things like, no, I can never take any clonopin at all because it's category D. That, that is, so that's actually an inaccurate statement um, because the FDA does not use that system anymore and they have not used it in almost a decade, partially because medications were being erroneously um, uh, graded as either less safe or frankly more safe than they actually were. The same thing is true when people talk about, some people think that because we do not do randomized control trials with pregnant patients, that somehow this is an evidence-free zone, that somehow we don't study anything at all. But it's actually interesting because most of our studies are done with prospective cohort um, observational trials, especially our neighbors in Northern Europe and the rest of Europe where they track every single birth very carefully. Some of our observational studies have 500,000 patients in them, 600,000 patients in them, 1.6 million patients in them. These are enormous studies, very well done, published in New England Journal of Medicine. These are not small pieces of data. And a lot of times, strangely enough, 
just when patients know that we're actually applying science here, that we actually, there's an evidence base to this, that people actually do rigorous studies and think about these issues very carefully, that can actually go a long way to relieving their anxiety and relieving the stigma and judgment. Because underneath that idea, and this is why I feel I'm very committed to women's mental health as a field, why I participated so much in the National Curriculum Project and we wrote the textbook, is because when you decide that women's mental health is a field, that means we've decided as medical doctors that this is worthy of study. That means we've decided as medical doctors that that's worthy of scientific evidence. And that gives a message to our patients that their experience matters. And so one of the things that's always, I find very, I, people have been, like I take a quite evidence-based view when I talk to my patients and I've always been surprised at how much they appreciate that. But I think one of the reasons why they appreciate that is that we, they know that we're taking them seriously. This is not sort of, oh, the patient is crying or they're upset or, right? We understand that we're applying rigor and diagnostic criteria and study resources and other things because we're actually listening to their experience. That can actually, strangely enough, have a strongly destigmatizing effect. The third thing that I do, I'll mention four um, uh, ways that I approach this, but the third is making sure that I emphasize the context. Um, because what I mean by that is, I'm gonna editorialize here, but rates of certain women's mental health issues like postpartum depression are disproportionately high in the United States as compared with other countries. If we take, for example, the issue of postpartum depression going way up in the pandemic, there is something structural going on, right? This is not that suddenly every single in, you know, individual woman is having more problems than anybody else. One of the difficulties, so for example, I actually think the pandemic was a perfect example of the structural problems. We had many women threatened with the idea of giving birth alone when hospitals were on major shutdown. You have women, I cannot tell you how many patients I have had who really suffered under the idea that they were way too socially isolated. They did not have the level of social support that they needed. They did not have the level of feeding support that they needed. We cannot give birth in a vacuum. And I think that one of the, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of issues around um, trying to figure out why rates of depression went up so high in the pandemic, but these problems were there to begin with already in our society. And, you know, when, and I try not to get too far down some sociologic thing, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm not a sociologist, but I do try to put their situation in a context. And I try to say like, listen, you are not alone. It really feels, for example, like this is a you issue when it's not. So for example, even the rates of postpartum depression going up in the pandemic, we're told that we're supposed to do this all on our own. We're told that we're supposed to be super women, but the truth is nobody's meant to give birth alone. And then I try to go back to evidence base again and say, you know, there's, for example, there's a good reason why the World Health Organization recommends 24 hour labor support during labor, that is a, a guideline that, that the World Health Organization promotes. So you're not alone in this, there's a structural context going on. So that again, trying to reduce the sense of individual guilt and self-blame and judgment. And then the last thing is, and this is a, a big issue, I think in general, in, generally in, um, in medicine, but this is a, a really important issue in terms of women's mental health is the idea of collaborative decision-making. So um, one of the things I will say about this is there are some special cases around collaborative decision-making that are, I think, quite specific to women's mental health. So for example, um, this is, uh, uh, so, When women are trying to make decisions, particularly, for example, about taking a medication 
in either pregnancy or postpartum breastfeeding. One of the difficulties that comes up is that on the one hand, that patient is perfectly capable of understanding the statistics, right? They might say, yes, I understand that the risk of one outcome is one in a thousand, or yes, I understand that the risk of another outcome is one in 10. And yes, I understand that the risk of not treating um, my severe anxiety or depression, I understand that. However, this is not entirely an intellectual discussion at all. There are, because, and one of the issues around this has to get, it gets to the idea of relational ethics. There, a woman in this period of time or any pregnant person at this period of time is actually thinking of multiple different people's well-being at, their, at one time. They're thinking of the well-being of their baby. They're thinking of their own well-being. They're trying to figure out, hey, which one am I going to prioritize? Which one is going to sort of make, you know, which one should make the difference? This particularly becomes very true during pregnancy with a developing fetus where someone is saying, I'm really worried about the risks and am I being selfish for taking care of my well-being? This comes up all the time and it makes collaborative decision-making even more important. It's also why, now this is just, um, and I'm happy to talk about how I got to this point. This is just my own practice style. I will just go ahead and say, this is my own practice style. After more than a decade of doing this, I have felt very strongly about at the end of a consultation visit, it is my role to give a very clear set of recommendations because, and with the idea of them going away, not feeling judged or stigmatized because I realized over time that if you present an intellectual set of data and say, hey, um, you know, the risk of X is one in 10, the risk of Y is one in a hundred. And then you say, well, it's really up to you and it's your decision. Most of my patients don't respond well to that. Now, yes, it is their decision, right? They understand that they're autonomous human beings. They don't have to take our advice, right? But one of the issues that is very hard is they're caught in a bit of an emotional bind because of the relational ethics issue. They wanna know what an expert says in terms of balancing risks. Right? We want to say, hey, this is the risk of a medication exposure, but this is also the risk if you remain untreated. And what I will often do is try and place their situation in the context and say, hey, in my experience, I have seen milder versions of the anxiety that you have. I see moderate versions and I see severe versions and I will give them an assessment of where I think they lie on that. So for example, I will probably say if someone comes to me with very mild anxiety, I will feel clear to say, I'll feel confident saying to them, you know what, actually compared to, you know, at, uh, what I would say is, you know, you've had a few days of feeling like you're very overwhelmed, but you've also been, you know, feeling actually quite capable and confident in the last couple of weeks. It sounded like there was an early struggle. It sounds like you've done an amazing job putting together coping mechanisms, putting together more support. I actually think that right now we might be okay. My recommendation would be a bit of a conservative watch and wait. Let's get a little bit more support. Let's do some cognitive reframing. And so to sort of give them a clear recommendation rather than saying, well, you could take a little bit of Ativan if you want, right? That again, it, um, it introduces a bit too much ambiguity there. Again, I might say something like one option is Ativan. However, right now I might recommend holding off on that. You might feel differently and I'm happy to, to talk through that conversation. But right now we might consider holding off and seeing, and seeing what you do with a little bit more time and a little bit more support. Because if I've listened carefully enough, I'm actually gonna be matching, I'm gonna be leading from behind and matching usually what this person is saying, what they want anyway. Most of the time that person with fairly mild symptoms would have already said, I wanna try and avoid a medication if I can, I just wanna check in with you and make sure that 
you're not seeing something that I'm not seeing. However, someone on the other end of the spectrum, someone with really severe anxiety, they're having disabling panic attacks, they're not sleeping at all, their depression is starting to get a grip. That's someone where I would feel fairly comfortable saying something like, hey, you know what? These symptoms have really gotten a grip. And in my experience, this is a situation where um, medications tend to be a very good scaffold and a good safety net for this type of situation. I am really happy to, to, to talk through the pros and cons with you. And at the same time, I would have a very low threshold to do a medication in this context. Again, I want to preserve their autonomy. I want to preserve their independent decision making. But at the same time, I want to frame the conversation so that they're very clear on what I am suggesting. And that way, it can tend to reduce some guilt that people feel no matter what they're doing, because say, for example, they do end up taking a medication, they can say to themselves, you know what, Dr. Hutner has seen these patients for over a decade, and she felt like it was probably a good idea. I'm actually sort of doing, I am making the decision to go along with that advice. Um, again, this can sometimes have some nuance, of course, because we always want to fully support their autonomy. Um, but again, I, I think that the idea of giving very, very clear recommendations is really important. So I see a bunch of items in the chat. I'm going to stop here for a moment. Um, I don't know if I can actually see the chat. I'm on a Mac here. I don't know if I can actually see the chat. But um, I can handle the chat for you if you'd like. Okay, that would be wonderful. So it, at this point, it's mostly comments, which I actually love that people were were chit chatting away. Um, oh, good! But, I haven't actually seen them, so I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, so people were interacting, which I love. So, but if you have questions, please do put them in the chat. Or we're a small enough group that we can unmute if people would like to do that. Um, I just ask that you raise your hand so we can have a little bit of order. Lisa, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, thank you so much. As I mentioned in the chat, I feel like you've been describing my own experience, but my oldest son is now 22. So fortunately, I did not experience Facebook, social media to the hill. Yes, yes. So I can't even imagine adding all that on. Um, so I just, you know, I, I, I'm feeling a little bit anxiety thinking back at how it was when I first had it. But one question I kind of have, and I, it's like, I don't want to even load more on women. Um, but when I look at my two pregnancies, I have two sons, they were pretty close in age. And the one in which I was very stressed, I also should clarify, I'm a genetic counselor by training. So mm -hmm. I already had so many worries and concerns about yes. you know, their health. The one son, my oldest, who I was much more nervous during pregnancy, much more anxiety ridden after, he's still like my problem child. Like he's my son who we, he has anxiety too. And we both kind of like feed off each other. And I mean, to this day, we still have those issues. My other son, because they were only about 16 months apart, which was not on purpose. He is, I just couldn't <laughs> worry as much about him because mm -hmm. I was already dealing with the older one. And I just was much more even healed, I think, because of course he was my second too. So I figured I kept one alive. I could probably do the other one. <laughs> Right, so, like, I can't worry about this anymore. Right, and so, and he is a total, I mean, he's totally different kid. So I guess my question is, and again, thinking my genetics hat, like epigenetics, I mean, has there been studies looking at, you know, stress and anxiety of women while they're pregnant and what, if any, impact it may have on children, um, you know, their behavior. And again, maybe more as a way to justify why women really do need to be you know, caring for themselves and attending to their own issues while they're pregnant, certainly after, in a way that will help their babies too. So yes, I, I, um, I'll talk to them sharing too much detail of my own life. Like, no, like, I, I think like resonated a lot. <laughs> oh, I'm I'm so glad, and um, and also Dr. Katapano, feel free to um, chime in here too because um, I am sure she has a lot to say about this too. I mean, a few things about what you said um, and then I will absolutely address that question. Number one, it's interesting too, like um, just from a sibling standpoint and you were mentioning that, you know, the first child is, feels like it's a more challenging experience. Um, sometimes, as you mentioned, when 
one parent has anxiety and a, and a child is a little bit prone to anxiety, there's a mirroring effect, right? And so there's a bit of an identification. And sometimes that identification is a good thing, but sometimes it can be a little bit like, oh, I'm looking in the mirror, right? So that can feel a little bit more fraught um, than the second child. You're sort of like, okay, it's fine. Everything's fine with them. I think the other thing I would say is, yes, I mean, social media, boy, oh boy, uh, there's a topic for a whole nother day, but um, oh, I'll just, uh, <laughs> um, I, I think some of the intentions and some of the information can be terrific. Um, it, is, it is a needle in the haystack though. And unfortunately it's an enormous haystack that is a very loud explosive haystack. So it's, it's very hard. And it's one of the reasons why, again, I think both Lisa and I have developed a quite evidence-based rigorous approach because you really wanna move away from opinionating and the loudest voices being heard, et cetera, et cetera. I think that the core of the question that you were asking about um, um, ang stress, anxiety, and pregnancy, um, I'm going to answer it the way that I answer this for my patients who ask me this commonly, um, which is that because again, if we think about the judgment, guilt, and self-blame issue, if I say, yes, stress and anxiety is really bad for your pregnancy, which is something I've never said, but if I said that, they are going to feel terrible about themselves for having one smidgen of anxiety. That is not a realistic assessment. It will make, it will be a very non-therapeutic statement. Um, and so I do try and thread a needle and I usually say something, I try to say something reassuring first. So for example, I will say, listen, all of us can immediately think of all kinds of scenarios in which people have gotten pregnant and stayed pregnant and delivered under highly adverse circumstances, genocide, war, right? You know, their um, sexual assault. Um, there are all sorts of circumstances that are extraordinarily stressful. And nevertheless, the person gets and remains pregnant. So if we think about it that way, you know, the other thing that I try to reassure them about is that we are biologically wired to have changes in our ovulation pattern in response to extreme stress. So for example, this is one of the reasons why patients with anorexia nervosa, when they are not there, they don't have their periods anymore because they're not ovulating because their hypothalamus says, there's a famine going on. This is too stressful of a situation. And so I'm gonna shut down your reproductive access. So part of what I try to encourage patients to, to think is like, let's think of the context here you were able to get pregnant, your body allowed you to become pregnant, your hypothalamus gave you a go signal, right? And what I try to say is a mild and even a moderate amount of stress is actually, I, I try not to say it's gonna be fine, but I'll, I'll say something like, listen, a mild to moderate amount of stress is fine, it or is common, if you look around your social circle, most of those people have been under a similar amount of stress and you can look at their babies and they appear fine, right? Some of the data, even though the data can be relevant, that's not always clinically relevant. So for example, really significant anxiety um, um, has been shown to um, uh, increase the rates of prematurity, but that's by like, a few days, right? So the baby is born at 39 weeks and four days instead of 40 weeks and one day. Is this super clinically relevant? Not really. So while it is, it, it, and the one last thing on the reassuring end I will say is that actually it's thought that not all stress is by nature pathological. So for example, um, it's actually shown that a mild to even perhaps a moderate amount of stress actually doesn't negatively Im impact birth outcomes at all. For example, it actually speeds the maturation of lung tissue late in pregnancy and gets actually the baby more ready for delivery to, to begin with. So there's some level of stress and adaptation that goes on. 
Um, what we want to avoid, if we can, are the severe stressors. And we all understand intuitively what severe stressors are. That's a whole sort of different type of category. But what I try and say is to your point, I try and say, listen, um, I'm not going to say that stress and anxiety is a wonderful thing, but I don't want you to worry about worrying either. And so what we want to do is really focus on your well-being. You're allowed to focus on your well-being. You're allowed to take time for yourself. You're allowed to focus on your mental health. You're allowed to do those things. And in fact, optimizing your own mental health will never have any downsides and it'll only have upside. Um, Lisa, uh, Dr. Carpano, I'm curious if you have anything else to add to that or if there are any more questions specifically about that. Sure. Um, uh... I have uh, conversations like this a lot. Um, one uh, related angle to the way that you presented it is to say, um, at, as is your default, you are interpreting the situation as that it's your fault, right? That like you were anxious and so you made your child anxious. At least as likely is that you have a biological predisposition to anxiety and you have passed that on to your child. And that's a good thing, right? Because if you give birth to and raise an anxious child, you having anxiety and having worked to understand and manage your anxiety makes, makes you a better parent to that child. Kids who are anxious Absolutely. do better when they have an anxious mother who understands how this works and doesn't shame them or tell them to just stop doing it. Absolutely. I think that's um, incredibly important. And uh, I was also just gonna add a, um, a piece when you were talking about uh, not being a perfect mother and this is related to not just to motherhood, but to being a person in general and certainly a woman. Um, is usually if you say you don't have to be a perfect mother, you can be a good enough mother. What they hear is you're not good enough to be a perfect mother. So I'm giving you permission to be less than, which is disappointing and insulting <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't work. So having a more proactive explanation for why it is actually better yes. not to be perfect. So one on the cognitive level, perfection means not prioritizing, right? It means like you're perfect on all points. And so if you're talking about motherhood, if you're talking about partnership, if you're talking about your professional standing, the idea that you could be perfect in all the elements of your job or your marriage or your motherhood is unrealistic and learning to be, uh, learning to prioritize is part of figuring out how to do those roles. And on the emotional side, um, being a perfect mother is not better for your kids. Just like being a perfect wife is not better for your partner. I mean, in the short term, it's kind of nice that you like clean the whole house and are like, oh, sexually available, et cetera, right? But like the expectations that that sets up are not healthy um, and, and same in your job, right? Like being endlessly available to do everything all the time sets up expectations that are not helpful. So talking more proactively about why it is better not to be perfect probably not in the first session when they're like completely overwhelmed, but eventually getting to that can be really helpful. Wonderful, thank you both. Uh, we have a question from Lisa Bagby. And by the way, the non-Lisas can ask questions too. <laughs> <laughs> I had that same thought. I was like, gosh, the three questions are all Lisa's. Um, so thank you for your talk. Uh, my name is Lisa Bagby. I am a faculty member in the newly developing occupational therapy program. So okay. a couple, I have a couple of things. One, thinking, you know, I'm always thinking like, how can students collaborate in other places where OT is typically not found? Um, and thinking about occupational therapy and how much we look at and work with patients based upon, or not just patients, people in general who aren't patients, about roles, routines, functions, their identity, and how that plays a role in how they participate in everyday occupations. Um, and thinking about, you know, you gave the um, scenario of around um, like your identity changes overnight. I saw something in the in the comments about that. Like you have a child and then all of a sudden your identity is a mother. And a lot of times, you know, things that I've even witnessed with friends and working with people um, is that they lose sight of the meaningful occupations in their life 
that mm-hmm. don't have to do with caring for and keeping alive this tiny being. So um, just thinking about how OT could really partner in ways to establish routines or structures within a mother's new identity or new reality and and finding ways to find meaning in, in the things that they enjoy, but recognizing that it might look a little different. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is really more personal and thinking about, you know, as a black woman, you know, and knowing the, the maternal child health disparity with race mm-hmm. um, and knowing what I know about, you know, health and, and stress related to pregnancy. And um, like, what do you say to people like me who know about those things, um, who do have concern about what I look like going into a physician's office or an OBGYN or whatever for maternal and child health care and bias and knowing that, you know, the, the statistics are out there because of a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, But then also like knowing that, like, how, how do you process that and, and help somebody come to terms with knowing that that's a thing, Mm -hmm. but then also thinking about the racial implications of stress outside of, being a parent and how that impacts pregnancy and all of those things like the the inner relations and intersections there um because I would like to eventually probably have a child but you know I also think about like how does society look at me as a as a black single woman who has a child Mm -hmm. without knowing anything about me you know I mean in DC it's different but I lived in Nebraska till a year ago yeah and so I was really reticent to even think about having a child because of the stigma mm-hmm. of black women and being single parents, mm-hmm. not necessarily for myself, but as my child grows up, having to explain to them why someone is rude to me or explain to them, you know, different things and having to educate them about the things that are like that they shouldn't have to know about or even mm-hmm. witness. But I mean, I even grew up like having a, my mom is white and people asked her where she got her children mm-hmm. um, and she gave birth to us. So just thinking about all those different, like, do you experience that in your practice? And, and I guess, how do you address that? Yeah. Um, I am so incredibly grateful to you to asking those questions, Lisa. And um, uh, one thing I'll say right away um, when I address this is that anything I say will, of course, be blinded by my own white privilege. So um, I'm highly cognizant of that that gap. So um, I approach this issue with humility. Um, Boy, is there a huge mountain to climb and the burden of that mountain falls on the medical profession. Um, There is no doubt that there is an enormous amount of racism within medicine. It is deeply embedded within medicine and um, it shows up all over the place. I mean, all of us, I, I made a reference to it earlier in the, in the talk, but for example, the United States has the highest rate of maternal mortality in the developed world, and that disproportionately falls upon Black women. There is no excuse for that. There should be zero tolerance for that sort of problem. And, um, And there's even data that has come out to, and you might be familiar with this, but for example, perceived bias and perceived racism is directly related to poor perinatal health outcomes, not just perinatal mental health outcomes, but health outcomes themselves. Being perceived as not being heard and listened to, which is the core of this topic, um, and and, um, uh, implicit bias and other issues that get in the way, those are independent risk factors for poor health outcomes. Um, I'll, I'll say a little tiny bit about my own experience. And again, I approach this um, from a humble perspective, not being able to, to really ever put myself in a black person or other person of color's shoes. Um, when we um, started uh, Phoebe, which was our startup, um, it launched in 2019 and uh, uh, then the pandemic happened in 2020. And um, because um, one of the things that we really wanted to do was um, have a diverse membership right away and really support our black members. Um, And so, um, however, 
many of the members there were, when I say terrified to give birth, I mean terrified because they were terrified that not only were they going to go into the hospital and give birth alone during the height of the pandemic, they were going to go into the hospital, give birth and die. And um, because they were highly aware of the maternal mortality statistics. And so one of the things that we did is we set up a virtual doula program where one, our wonderful doulas um, all volunteered eight to 12 hour shifts to do this on. This was like when nobody was using Zoom yet, like it was like not a thing um, because we refused to have any of our members give birth alone. And then we also set up a black women's peer to peer buddy system where all of the women who had given birth in the prior year, if they wanted to, like it was purely voluntary, but could serve as a peer to peer buddy so that nobody ever felt um, like they were giving birth alone. Interestingly, there is a system um, that makes fairly effective use of doulas, especially for women in Black communities in Oakland and um, other places like UCSF is actually pretty good on this, um, on this front. And so there have been other initiatives, but two resources that I might um, um, think of. Um, one is, have you ever heard of the website um, Therapy for Black Girls? Um, that was run, that was started by a woman named um, Joy Harden something. Um, I cannot remember her name, but um, she is, it, it's a fantastic website where it's a website and it's an online community. Um, it was started by a black psychologist um, and sh her, it's um, people get emails, they get, there's a Facebook group, there's blogs, there's a podcast, and it's basically Black women coming together to support women's mental health. It's run by the psychologist because she understood that there was a real need for there to be communication, community, and support, um, particularly for Black women. The other thing is um, there is, and this is one of my collaborators, but actually there's um, a psychiatrist right in DC. Her name is Callie Cyrus. Um, she might, if anyone is ever interested in having her be a speaker, she's on faculty at Johns Hopkins, um, C-Y-R-U-S. Um, the company that I'm now a strategic advisor for, Gemma, um, the person who founded it is a person of color, Pooja, Pooja Lakshman, and the other co-founder is a Black psychiatrist, um, Kelly Cyrus, who is in D.C., and she is a queer psychiatrist, so she also focuses on LGBT issues. And her entire focus is really caring for Black women, particularly in the LGBT community, but really she's a major DEI strategist. Um, those are just some resources, but what I would say is, honestly, the onus is on the entire medical system. Um, there is a lot to be accounted for, and um, the racism that's there is real. And it has a major impact on health outcomes and mental health outcomes. So I'm so happy that you brought that up. Um, I, um, Dr. Norris or Lorenzo Norris, I'm not, I see, maybe, I'm not sure if you put your hand up. I want to defer did. to you. Oh, okay. Okay, good. So I, um, if you had something to say on this topic, I'm sure. happy. Okay. Absolutely. Well, first off, Dr. Huttner, I want to thank you so very much for uh, this lecture. This has uh, been uh, phenomenal. Um, I do, before, uh, well, a couple of things. One, I want to acknowledge um, the contributions of Dr. Rosemary Bowes in regards to sponsoring um, this lecture series, as well as our w Women's Wellbeing Initiative. So, uh, Dr. Bowes, as always, thank you so very much for this extremely, uh, your generosity and productive conversation. Uh, our Women's Wellbeing Champion uh, uh, and Dr. Lisa Catapano, and I will fully, 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 completely own um, that I have the pleasure of all these conversations you just heard, I literally would just walk into her office unannounced <laughs> all the time and sit down and, hey, Lisa, all right? And she'll, she'll tell you, and he'll be like, Lorenzo, why don't you knock? I'm like, I don't care. I got to talk. So um, that so I, I really have, I miss those conversations, but I used to get that all the time, and I was so greedy, and I got every bit of it. Um, I want to thank um, all the folks from the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center, uh, especially uh, everybody, um, but our Associate Director, Dr. Lee Frame, as well as our Behavioral Health Director, uh, Ms. Victoria Karakeva, all the folks that put this together, and the rest of our team, Ms. Janet Rodriguez, Ms. Ashley Drapeau, and um, Ms. Ashley 
Janet. And I said, Victoria, okay, great. So, and then the final thing is um, I wanted to thank everybody who attended. This was a really great conversation. Thank you all the people that contributed, all the L's and those who put things into the chat. And I'm an L too, so I guess it's just L's. And then the last thing um, I just wanted to make, just because I, I I had to just comment on it. I thought that um, Lisa's um, comment, all of Lisa, but Miss uh, Bagby's comments in regards to single Black uh, mothers raising um, kids, I can only speak from my perspective as a cisgender African-American male who was raised by a single um, African-American mother. Um, so, but what I would say is that, um, and this can be its own conversation, I, I think it's so important that you raise this, but I think a lot of the key things that at least I saw my mother do were actually brought up here uh, by our speaker. Um, the first thing was information. Make sure you have accurate information about what to do, how to do it, whether it's child work, whether it's schooling. Uh, the next thing was, support. It was absolutely a village. She did not try to do it alone. Uh, the other thing is collaboration. I, I love what Dr. Huntner said in regards to collaborative spirit. And so what my mom did, she would always look for those people in every area, but she looked for if they did it when nobody was looking. Like what mm -hmm. would, did they walk the walk and walk the talk? And for those who don't know, I'm a child of like the, the 80s, like born in 73. So I mean, things were they aren't how they are now. So, um, and then probably, and this is going a nod to uh, Dr. Catapano and something that she said, uh, it, was, it was a bit of an approach, but I, my mom kind of always viewed, who was in a better position than me to help you navigate racism? Mm -hmm. who, who are you going to learn from when you, when you don't get the promotion and things of that nature, or mm -hmm. when you don't get this, I'm, I'm going to be in that position that you're going to be able to overcome adversity. So um, I still remember when my mother actually got passed up for a position in the uh, VA, uh, a, a big administrative position. And she said, well, you know, what? we're going to keep on going on. And she did. And one of the things in this, I will share one of the reasons why, for those who don't know, um, in terms of the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center, uh, I'm a I, along with Lee, I direct the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. And one of the reasons for me personally that I wanted to see our one of our signature strengths be women's well-being um, was just off of my mother and the experience and watching what she went through and the pain, the crying, the this, but the the accomplishments, all of it. Uh, and I feel like I'm a direct result of her uh, in terms of her work. So this is, uh, and obviously uh, Dr. Bose in her contribution, but this is something that I have a very personal vested interest in from my own upbringing. So if, if the story resonates and it resonates, but everybody does have stories. So in any event, I wanna leave it to uh, Dr. Frame. Uh, do you have final comments to uh, close us out? Um, I would just like to add, I am not a parent, but I, for quite a large portion of my life, was the child of a single mother as well, and I can only imagine how she did it. Um, sometimes women try to be superwomen. Um, it's completely unrealistic, um, but just doing what you can is enough, right? Like, we're here. Lorenzo and I are here. We are, we were raised. We, they were successful, and they did what they could. Um, so I think for me, that's the take home message, you know, do what you can and it will be enough. Mm -hmm. And thank you all very much for joining us. And thank you so much for coming, Lucy, and speaking. Oh, thank my you. gosh. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was delightful. Thank you. Bye, it's everyone. wonderful what you're doing down there. It's great. Absolutely. Come back anytime. Come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So come on, you, don't get me started. You know how I am. I, I, <laughs> I do know how you are. I think you're all. On the car. Yes, please. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.